deal indeed it would almost be essential this evening for you to have your Bible open at Philippians chapter 2. Let me explain immediately why we are turning to this passage this evening. Last Sunday evening, as part of our general morning study of uh, Luke's Gospel, and it may seem peculiar to you that we have a study in Luke and Sunday evening when we are really going through it in the morning, but uh, that's just part of our perversity, and we continued last Sunday evening the theme of the morning and were considering Jesus teaching his sober, serious, and in so many ways difficult teaching on the subject of self-denial and self-humbling and self-sacrifice. That is taking up the cross, as Jesus describes it in Luke 14, as a principle of Christian living. Now this evening, it seems a natural thing that we should go on to think about Jesus' example of self-denial and self-humbling. And that, of course, is why we read that familiar passage to most of us in Philippians chapter 2. Nowhere in Scripture, I suppose, do we have a more remarkable description and example of our Lord's practicing what he preached. Because this is precisely what we are reading about in Philippians 2. The same Lord Jesus Christ who urges upon us that we deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow him, himself is the greatest example in the universe of that very self-denial and self-humbling. And these verses in Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5, are a very special insight into the way that Jesus embraced self denial rather than self-assertion, and self-sacrifice rather than self-indulgence as the principle of his life. Nowhere in time or space has there been a clearer example of putting the interests of others before self-interest than in the coming and living and dying of Jesus Christ. And Paul uses that as an example and stimulus to us that by God's grace we would come to live the same way. That's what Paul is about in this passage. This is why he begins to tell us how the Lord Jesus came from the incredible and unimaginable glory of heaven to be made one with us and to die a sinner's death on the cross. It is for this reason that we might let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the example is being given to us here for the same reason as the teaching in Luke 14, that we might live this way. Now, let me say a word to you, first of all, about the background in Philippians 2 of this remarkable passage. The particular background, as you would have noticed at the early verses of our reading, when Jesus' example is urged upon us by Paul, is the background of discord and division between fellow Christians. That is, there were people in this excellent fellowship at Philippi who were not getting on very well with each other. There were divisions, there was disharmony, disunity, there were people who, as it were, I was almost going to say spiritually speaking, but they would have said so were at each other's throats. Notice verse 2. Complete my joy, says Paul, by being of the same mind, 
having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, and clearly they were not, and that was the problem. Look at chapter 4, verse 2, where Paul is entreating two members of that church, you Odia and Syntyche. It is thought that they were two ladies. Uh, that doesn't specially matter, I think. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And I also ask you, true yoke fellow, help these women. There are two women in this fellowship, he says, who need help. Now, says Paul, I beseech you, help them, because they have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, these were fellow workers. They were Christian servants. They were people who had stood alongside the apostle, yet there was something that had happened that had set them at each other. And you get this appalling picture that is all too common in the history of the Christian church. I mean the contemporary history of the Christian church of people who are not getting on. Who even as they look each at each other find, if the truth were told, that hatred rather than love wells up in their being. It's true, my friends. And this is what brings Paul to say... Let this mind which was in you, in Christ Jesus, be in you. Look at his example. Live as he lived. Learn from him. The connection, of course, is very simple. It is that what so often produces ill feeling and bad relationships and disharmony is some form of proud self-interest and self-centeredness and self-conceit, a refusal to put others and their interests first and to put ourselves and our own interests before them. So in verses 3 and 4, do you notice how Paul diagnoses the root of the problem? Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility, count others better than yourselves. That's a very penetrating thing. It's a very interesting. My dear friends, do do that. Is that how you live? Is that the principle of your life this evening? Let each of you, verse 4, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And to clarify what that means, he sets before them the example of Jesus in verse 5 in the NIV, which fortunately I've written down on this piece of paper because my own has fallen on the floor. And I take that as a providence. I'm intended only to concentrate on the one version this evening. Your attitude, says Paul, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So here is Jesus our example in living a selfless, self-denying life. Of course, Jesus gave us examples of self-humbling often. For example, in the washing of the disciples' feet, and he said, if I have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And that was an example of humility. But these were examples, and there are others, from what he did this example is unique because it is an example from what he became in himself. Now, there are three things that we need to look at more closely from this passage if we are to grasp what Jesus' example involves, even in some small way. They are, if you like, three Stages of Jesus self-humbling because here the apostle is describing to us how the Lord Jesus Christ came down from that infinite glory of the Father's presence and ultimately was found hanging as an object of derision and shame and mockery the offscouring of the earth upon a cross 
And that process of self-humbling has certain stages that the apostle spells out to us. You will notice the first one is the divine glory which belonged to him by nature and by right. That's what he says in the early parts of these verses. Secondly, the servant attitude which characterized him both as he came to earth and in his earthly life. And thirdly, the humble obedience which led him ultimately to the death of the cross. Now, says Paul, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's look at these three stages, as it were, of Jesus' self-humbling. The divine glory which belonged to him, first of all, And for Paul, it is of great importance, and it is for us as well, to establish this truth. Because, you see, the thing which makes Jesus self-humbling so arresting and overwhelming is the unique honor and the exalted glory which he left. That's why Paul labors this whole idea of what Jesus was in his native sphere, if you like what it was that he left to come to earth. Now, of course, there is a sense in which we shall never really begin to fathom that. We are creatures, we are finite, we are not equipped in a sense to understand it. But there is a measure of it here that we need to try to grasp. Because unless we grasp something of what the Lord of glory forsook to come and humble himself to become a man, We shall never really see the example of our Lord as Paul intended. The significance of it is something like this, you see. Think, for example, of some large national or international company that is expecting a royal visit. And suddenly, quite a short time before the visit is due, there appears in the entrance hall some filthy mess say a sewer has spilled over or something of the kind and there is alarm and distress and the question is who is going to clean it up? Now it would not be a great surprise if the cleaner ladies were called in and asked we'll need to do something about that and do it quickly we would say that's the sort of thing that would normally be done but if the managing director came down from his rooms and took off his jacket and put on his overalls and set about clearing up the mess down on his hands and knees, you would say that is a remarkable example of self-humbling. Because it's not at all the thing that belongs to his station. Ah, but think. What if the queen were to come in? And you had to look through the door and see that she had, as it were, stepped off her throne and come right into this situation and put on her apron. I'm not very sure if she has one, but if she put on her apron and kneeled down amongst this mire and wiped it up, what would you say? You would say that's the most astonishing example of self-humbling and a readiness to put others' interests before ourselves that we have ever seen because of her station because of the dignity and glory that belongs to her in her person. Now Paul says, listen to this, he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, and he begins to tell us about him, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself or made himself nothing, took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and came down to the lowest depths of the dregs of the world's sin. Now that's what catches the apostle's breath. And he tells us of his dignity in two ways. First of the dignity of his being. 
Have you grasped, says the apostle, who he was? Well, here it is in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves which was in Christ Jesus, who, although he was in the form of God. Now, we need to understand that phrase. It does not mean that he had a form like God, that is, that he was somehow less than God, not fully God. Nor does it simply mean in the original that he was God and that the apostle is saying he had the form of God and was God. What he is saying is something even more than that. He is saying, and I quote one of the leading authorities to help us to understand the meaning of the word, the essence of this usage is that Jesus is essentially originally, natively, God in the full possession of all that is distinctive of God in his majesty and glory. Paul's design by the language he uses is to, the, to speak of the dignity of unabridged deity. Now that's what the apostle is speaking of when he says he was in the form of God. He is saying everything that goes to the being and person of God you find in Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him. And everything that we may predicate of God was in Jesus. That's what the apostle says. So he was there in the being of God. That's the dignity of his being. But notice now the dignity of his station. That's the other side of this. In verse 6, says the apostle, he was in the form of God, and the second thing, he had equality with God. That is, within the Godhead, the Father and the Son had an equality of dignity and station. They possessed the same exalted majesty and glory. And all the angels and archangels of whom we've been singing this evening worshipped and adored and bowed down before the second person of the Trinity because he was exalted to a place of infinite majesty and glory that belonged to him. Now Paul speaks of that equality in a particular way in verse 6. Notice, it was not something Jesus grasped or took hold of. That's the significance of the phrase, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The point is, it was his by right. Do you know the hymn, the head that once was crowned with thorns, is crowned with glory now, it has aligned the highest place that heaven affords is his, is his by right. That is, he did not seek it. He did not grasp it. He did not make it his at some point in eternity. It belonged to him. Now that distinguishes the second Adam who is Christ from the first Adam. Do you remember that what he sought to do was to grasp after equality with God. Satan said, you shall be like gods, and they grasped after it and ate. And found that they became slaves. But for Jesus, that was something he did not grasp. It was his by right. But you will notice also that it means that he did not use his equality with God as a platform for self-advantage. He used it to choose to become a servant. Now there is the great distinction between the second Adam and the first Adam. The second Adam used the position that God had given to him, albeit that he was not God, but he was invested with a special glory. God had given him the crowning glory of creation and made him the master of his created order, and man used that as a platform for self-display and for selfish advantage. 
Do you recognize yourself in the picture? This is why Jesus spoke so much about it, because it is the native tendency of sinful human nature to use everything as a platform for selfish advantage. Now that leads me to the second main thing that is here in this passage, the divine glory which belonged to him first of all and now the servant attitude which characterized him. Notice verse 7. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Instead of using equality with God as a base for self-interest, he rather made himself nothing, the NIV says, took the form of a servant and was born in the likeness of men. But if you have an RSV, you will see it says he emptied himself instead of he made himself nothing. I think that's probably a rather wooden translation in the RSV, and I have little doubt that the NIV has the right sense. It means literally, he made himself nothing, he emptied himself, but in the sense of making himself, the authorized version has, of no reputation. But we might use that word, which is the word for emptying, to ask, what did Jesus empty himself of? when he became man? Well, clearly not his deity, because Paul says of him in his incarnate state that in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead. Nor did he empty himself of his equality with the Father, because Jesus says, I and my Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen my Father. But he did lay aside something. And what he laid aside is evidently his majestic glory and the riches of that majestic glory when he came into the world. Now that is why Jesus prays in John 17 that he might have that glory restored to him. Father, he says, glorify me. Now, do you remember the phrase? With the glory that I had with you before the world began. Now, there Jesus is reaching back into eternity and saying there was a glory that he shared with the Father, a majestic glory that really was all the riches of heaven. And Jesus divested himself of that and here before the cross he cries out, Let me have the glory back that I had with you before the world began. And I think that is what the apostle is meaning when he said, He who was rich, yet for our sakes became poor. Now he became poor in an outward sense, of course. People often say he had no place to lay his head. He had to borrow a tomb in which to be buried. He had to borrow a coin for the sake of an illustration. He became poor. Jesus identified himself with the poor. But that poverty was a sacrament, an outward visible sign of something that was infinitely deeper and inward. And it was his impoverishing himself of the heavenly glory in order that he might come down and become a man. And there is something in that that our finite minds cannot begin to understand, of course, simply because we are not fitted to grasp what that glory meant. But Jesus yearned for it as he prayed in John 17. And Paul summarizes this self-humbling of Jesus by saying, he took the form of a servant. 
Now you'll notice in verse 7 that that comes in Paul's words before he was born in the likeness of men. He says, first of all, he took the form of a servant. Now, if you think about it, the natural order, if you're following closely, the natural order that we would use would be, he was made in the likeness of men and took the form of a servant because he was. He said to his disciples, I am among you as one who serves. But here it comes beforehand. He took the form of a servant, and it's exactly the same word that's used earlier when it says he was in the form of God. Now, he who was everything that God is became everything that a servant is, and he did so, it appears, in a sense, in eternity. Now, what does that mean? Well, it here means that Jesus is becoming the fulfillment of what Isaiah's prophecy describes when in it God says, Behold my servant. Now you notice these passages in Isaiah which speak of the Savior. They are messianic passages as we say. They describe the servanthood and suffering of Jesus. But my dear friends, have you noticed He is not simply the servant of men. Jesus never submitted his will to the wills of men. Never. He is primarily the servant of the Father. And God says, behold, my servant. So here in the councils of eternity, God the Son subjects himself to the will of the Father gladly and joyfully for the sake of our salvation. And so he says again and again, and especially in John's Gospel, I am come not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The words that I speak are not my own words, but the words of him that sent me. He crowns it all in the garden of Gethsemane when he comes into the presence of the Father and he says again in this word of submission with the servant spirit not my will but your will be done now do you notice what the apostle is saying he is saying that when Jesus took the form of a servant he surrendered and subjected everything to the will of his Father. And when Jesus took human flesh, what Paul is saying to us when he says, let this mind, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, when Jesus took human flesh and became a servant, he was declaring that this is what human flesh is for. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the crunch. This is the crux of the whole of this example of Jesus. This is what human flesh is for. Not to be used and employed for selfish advantage. Not to be used and employed as a vehicle of doing my own will. But in order to do his will. Now, that's what Jesus is talking about in his teaching when he says, unless you take up the cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And that's what Jesus is exemplifying in his life when he became a servant, as I believe, before he took flesh and became man and from the beginning of his incarnation right through until his crucifixion every step of his life every moment of his time every asset he ever had in his hand was surrendered and subjected to the will of his father every word in his lips every thought in his mind every activity in which he engaged surrendered to the will of his father That is what this self-denial 
of which we were reading last Sunday evening in Luke 14 really means. I want to say to you this evening that you were made so that every faculty of your being might be bowed in the service of the God who has made you for himself. Rebel against that and resist it and you will break yourself on the broken law of God. Embrace it joyfully and it will be salvation to you. That's what Jesus exemplifies. That's what Paul means when he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I tell you, your destiny is mixed up with that. Some of you have come to Glasgow in recent days and are thinking about your future and your plans and your destiny and whatever life may hold for you. I want to say to you this evening that your true destiny is bound up with this whole business of surrendering everything you are and all that you have to be subjected to Jesus. That leads me to the third and last thing that I want to say. The divine glory which belonged to him by nature. The servant attitude which characterized him and which needs to characterize us. That in our relationship with God primarily and with one another secondarily, we shall be distinguished by the servant spirit. And thirdly, the humble obedience which led him ultimately to his death on the cross. That is halfway through, or coming to the beginning of verse 8. Being found in human form, what then did he do? The simple fact is, you see, that even when he had humbled himself to take our nature, Jesus could have used that position as a platform for self-display. He doubtless knew it. The devil certainly knew it. Because that's exactly what the devil did in Matthew 4 in his first great temptation. He comes to Jesus and he says to him, If you really are the Son of God, that is the Son of God in the flesh, command these stones that they may be made bread. Jump off the temple and make this position of the Son of God a platform for self-display. You notice what Jesus countered. He said, Get behind me, Satan, because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now that's the point, that's the significance, that's the crucial issue of coming under the word of God and letting its ministry touch your soul and bore into your conscience and permeate throughout every fiber of your being because man shall only live subjected to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's where life is to be found, my beloved friends. And death comes every other way. Isn't it significant that the first Adam grasped after life and after glory and used his position for self-advantage and he found death? And Jesus embraced obedience to the Father and took upon him voluntarily our death and was raised and exalted to life. Obedience is the way to blessing. There is no other, there is not a shortcut in all 
Christendom to that. Obedience is the way to blessing. And I want to say to you very simply that you ignore that and you will make shipwreck. So Jesus humbled himself. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient. You notice the apostle is saying, and this is the literal translation, he became obedient right up to death. That is, there were no limits to his obedience. There were no conditions that he placed upon it, no boundaries that he had put up and said, well, in there and in that area and in this, but not here, he was obedient right up to death. And Paul adds, even the death of the cross. That is, he who shared the essence of the glory of God in heaven. Have you grasped this, my dear friends? He who shared the very essence of the glory of God in heaven experienced the essence of the curse of God on the cross. And he was obedient right up to that point. Is it not extraordinary that our obedience frequently is delineated by our convenience? And when mild little inconveniences come our way, we cry out, where is God and what is he doing making me so uncomfortable? But some of us, some of us here in this building this evening, if we are going to be obedient to God, we are going to experience the pain and the distress of the cross cutting into our lives and across our self-will and our plans and our self-centeredness and the little kingdom that we privately build of our own where we are on the throne. And Paul says, it's this mind that was in Christ Jesus that needs to be in you. Who humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And at every stage he was saying, not my will but yours be done. That's what this means. And that's what Christian living is basically all about. Now some of you are saying, and I'd better recognize your question before we finish. Some of you are asking, and thank you for asking it, how can anybody live like this? How in God's name can anybody live that way? Well, of course they can't, left to themselves. But just look a bit further down, will you, at verse 13. God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's the secret. Work out your own salvation, says Paul, ah, but here is the glorious thing. God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He has his heart set on his own good pleasure in your life, and he's working in you to that end. The big question is, are you a rebel against his working? Or are you a servant as he works? That's the issue. 
there is nothing really bigger than this that you and I need to face. Are you saying tonight, not my will, but yours, Lord, by your grace, that's how I want to live, and you'll need to do it for me and in me, but I'll be your servant. And my rebellion is ended and I lay down my arms and I want to be that kind of man, that kind of woman. Or have you been saying secretly so that no other Christian can hear you and nobody will know as we go out through these doors shortly. But you're saying not your will actually but mine be done. God save you in his great mercy from that most tragic of all errors. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we bow down before you and plead with you that you would come and touch our lives by your Spirit and enable us to be like Jesus. We ask it with our whole being utterly cast upon you in Jesus' name. Amen.